Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Patrick Bassett, President of the National Association of Independent Schools. NAIS is the advocate for over 1,700 independent K-12 schools across the nation and abroad. Pat began his career as an English teacher at Woodbury Forest School in Virginia, and prior to joining NAIS in 2001, he served as president of the Independent Schools Association of the Central States. His many awards include global leadership awards from both the European Council for International Schools and from the Near East South Asia Council for Overseas Schools. Pat has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Pat, for joining us today. You're very welcome, Mark. The independent school movement is so important as part of the tapestry of, of K through 12 education. Thank you. Tell us about the independent school movement and the place of the association within that movement. Independent schools are the oldest schools in, uh, in the United States, 300 plus years old. Um, and they f serve a function of defining unique missions and populations that those missions are appropriate for. So um, an independent school is independent because it is a, its own not-for-profit corporation. And that gives it the uh, freedom to define its mission and it, the freedom to hire teachers by the qualifications the school de deems important and the freedom to develop its own programming and curriculum. It's not uh, directed by the state or the government. It's not directed by the church. It's directed by the people who are committed to the ideal of high quality education, defining what kind of programming will serve uh, children best. So that formula has worked extremely well for all these uh, decades and centuries. And those definitions emerge from a dialogue between parents or amongst parents, uh, teachers, administrators, uh, and students. Yes, it does. Uh, there is a kind of universal understanding at all levels about what's supposed to happen in school. Uh, school sometimes doesn't serve children very well universally because schools tend to be organized around the dictates of some kind of super authority and the needs of adults. But when you have uh, communities that are organically designed and integrated, where actually the parents have a voice that's influential, um, where the students and the faculty have a voice that's extremely uh, influential as a constituency, you end up uh, finding your way school by school in terms of what works for kids. And that's, that's actually our, I, I would say it's the most important contribution we make to the larger uh, sector of education. How do you design school so it actually meets the needs of kids? And how does one get clarity around the outcomes for young people that are the most important? And the reason I say, um, I believe it's, there, there are universal agreements about this, is that when you survey the population, of our country, uh, the public actually knows uh, what schools are supposed to do. They, they're very clear about it, and it, it has to do with what, what we call the five C's. One, critical thinking. Always has been important, always will be. Two, creativity. Three, collaboration or teaming. Four, communication, and by that I mean three forms, written, spoken, and technological fluencies. And five, character. I believe independent schools are committed to uh, that outcome, those outcomes for our children. There's also this debate that's going on about uh, whether uh, children can be manufactured or education can be delivered on an assembly line basis, yes. where all the all the children are viewed as raw material with uh, uh, sort of an uh, equal attributes. They they have age, right? Um, they are uh, male or female. Um, and they're going to put on the, be put on this assembly line, and they're going to be treated all in the same way, yeah. and somehow you're going to get excellent results across all these children if you just treat each person as if they were a product that is being manufactured. But that's not how people work. That's very true. Um, in fact, if you look at the great uh, building spurt of American schools, it happened in the 50s, right. the baby booms, the schools all actually look alike. They were built on a kind of cookie cutter model, uh, ranch style flat um, brick buildings. And there's a kind of anonymity to them. Yes. And that uh, itself is, runs counter to what kids need. Kid, kids want to be in exciting and interesting environments, the environment itself. The schools of the future, of course, in the schools of the future, um, 
and these, are, these will be schools that are renovated or built anew, the building itself becomes the textbook. There are, there are so many interesting elements of it, including environmentally sustainable uh, buildings so that uh, the green future we all anticipate and actually must be committed to becomes part of the uh, living text of the building itself. But way beyond that, uh, from you know, garden to table, actually children uh, raising food so they know where it comes from on the school property, harvesting it, eating it for lunch, all this becomes part of a much more dynamic uh, uh, curriculum and program that's uh, highly engaging for kids. So, yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right. Uh, and I would say this one other way. How long does it take to learn Algebra One? For hundreds of years, schools have had one answer to that, one year. Well, the true answer is, well, it depends on the child. In my own case, I had two daughters, one who was uh, fairly gifted in math, and it took her two weeks to learn Algebra One. So for 28 more weeks, she was locked in her seat, bo you know, bored to tears. Entirely a waste of time for her. And then I had a second daughter who had a learning difference uh, related to math, and it took her two years, two summer schools, and much prayer to, to master it, <laughs> actually, to get through Algebra One. So uh, 21st century schools actually are learning how to reorchestrate and organize so that that attention, that individu individualization that's expected is actually delivered upon. Right, and, and for the person that uh, can learn Algebra One in two weeks yeah. but might have uh, some difficulty in acquiring the rules of grammar. Exactly. Or have some difficulty in mastering the art of creation in the form of clay or, or wood, uh, that person can then dedicate that additional time right. to the thing that they need to, uh, to invest in. Exactly. But maybe, maybe at the same time do something a little bit differently, which would be to uh, try to invest more time in their passion and their strength. Because right. what actually engages young people is what uh, engages adults, the c capacity and the uh, conditions to pursue with, with vigor uh, a real passion. And what we find about kids is perhaps too about adults. When you have the opportunity to do what you love to do, um, there's kind of a halo effect over everything else. So kids who hate school end up loving school if they can devote more time to a strength, to a passion, be it math or music or whatever. And it tends to have a spillover effect on their commitment to their other courses and their discipline. So they do better. Well, you also beg the question in that answer um, of, of relevance. Yes. Relevance, what does relevance mean? Is, right. it, is it relevance to some productive capacity outside that are looking for job seekers of the future? Right. Is it relevance to the child itself? Is it relevance to, relevant to uh, society? And how relevant is our curriculum right. to actually our lives going into the future as opposed to the, the real fact that our curriculums are developed based on the past because right. that's the nature of things. You, you have a history, you have learning, people right. develop uh, curricula. Yes. And in a rapidly changing time, those curricula might be outdated by the time they hit the books. We're talking in the circles of uh, K-12 education about a, co a topic that actually should be um, relevant K-20 or K-24, if you will, which is uh, how do we think about the big shifts that are happening in education? And you've correctly identified one very big one, and it may be the biggest, which is the shift between knowing and doing. So uh, for all the hundreds of years we know about, let's say 600 years from the foundation of the university, Knowledge has been organized in discrete disciplines and uh, measured by your absorption of the facts and information and knowledge and your regurgitation of it on a test. So that's the way school has been defined for 600 years. And that's all about knowing but not about doing or demonstrating because people forget everything that they, they don't attach to something um, that's actually active and, and meaningful. So the big shift in education that I think the best schools, public and private, are actually capitalizing upon is uh, learning and knowing in the service of doing. So uh, robotics, for example, there's a lot of talk in America and elsewhere about the STEM uh, right. curriculum, st science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, um, learning math as an end in of itself, and maybe one day to get a five on the math AP, that's what school's been about. That pales in comparison to, to learning math, physics, engineering, programming, as you build a robot that actually performs a task on the basis of a team, right? 
So uh, that actually addresses three of the C's, creativity, uh, critical thinking, and collaboration in a context of actually doing something. So in our, in our best schools, we've got fourth graders building ro robots from scratch and program programming them. So they can find their way through a maze and at the end of the maze, throw a ball through a hoop, which is a fairly sophisticated um, task. And so when I work with parents or talk to large groups of parents, uh, I ask them, well, which class do you want your child in? Do you want your child in a class where you're just studying the math and if you're not on page 35 by Tuesday, there's a great deal of consternation? Or do you want your child in a class where the class itself is focused on doing something that's meaningful for the, for the child? And my only last thought would be, you know, what growing up is all about at some level is finding out you know, who you are, yes. but how you fit in the larger context of life itself. And it's a kind of existential journey. Of course, could, kids wouldn't put it that way. Uh, but the research shows us uh, Christensen and Horn disrupting class and their subsequent work, that kids actually show up to school for two reasons. One, to be with their friends. It's a very, so, it's a very important socializing process, school. Um, and actually, the saddest kids in America are those who don't have friends that, you know, get off the bus and run to be in the homeroom but with a teacher. Right. They've, not, they've not learned the skill uh, to be socialized and social. Um, but the second, second thing, that every kid is at every w level of his or her thinking, think, is wor worrying about is, how do I learn how to be successful? You know, there's a natural drive to take, up, take the cues, learn the lessons. What do I need to know? So in that context, kids actually at some level know when I actually have, take knowledge and apply it to something that's meaningful, I am testing out how I can be a contributor, how I can be successful, as opposed to you know, studying for a test and forgetting it. So that, that, that is a major, major change. In terms of, of, of ensuring that, that uh, children have this uh, experience of self-discovery and the acquisition of of not only knowledge, but knowledge that, that can be applied to right. some useful task. And also ensuring that the institutions that provide that are self-sustaining, tightly managed, uh, strong institutions that can move from generation to generation. How do you view the acquisition of talent and the incentivization of talent to join this, this endeavor? Teachers, administrators, um, People who work on the facilities, uh, people who um, who drive the the, the kids uh, to and from uh, from uh, uh, school. How do you view that process of acquiring great talent? Excellent question. So uh, we know this from the research and from the experience of observing education in high performing countries. Uh, we know that what motivates people actually in the for-profit world as much as the not-for-profit and educational world, maybe more so in some ways, are uh, what Dan Pink uh, identifies in his book Drive. Autonomy, the capacity to grow into mastery, and alignment with uh, uh, a purpose, a noble purpose. And school, you know, the business of school, there's not, I can't think of many other um, activities or, or uh, vocations in which you have all three of those aligned up, uh, initially anyways. So we recruit talent first by providing environments that allow for all three of those uh, uh, drivers to be in play. Actually, uh, No Child Left Behind has, uh, has powerfully uh, dulled those incentives to bring talent. And in fact, uh, really strong teachers are abandoning public schools because they just know at every level the, the mechanized way in which we're teaching towards the test and the only thing being important anymore is the, you know, the grade on the test. So it diminishes autonomy. Right. It diminishes mastery because right. it's prescriptive. Exactly. Um, and and uh, what was the third? Uh, uh, alignment with a noble purpose. It's no, the, the purpose, the purpose no is, to, is yeah. to pass the test. Pass the test, but also to, follow, to, to, to accept um, that the state knows what's important to test. But how so, do you set standards right. if, uh, because there is a need for, for some standard, sure. for some aspiration. Right. Is it really just a matter of 
of cajoling and 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 not doing uh, evidence-based reporting back right. and how, how do you know I, I believe uh, we'll we'll see a both and not an either or future so mm -hmm. there will always be a role but I, I think a lessened role for standardized tests because periodically of course schools need to know and students and parents how am I doing against the norm right so that that will uh, be a standard for a long time but but the way in which we do this will change because of what, what, what what's now called formative testing. The new technology enhanced testing is extraordinary in that it's computer adaptive. So let's take a child uh, doing a reading or a math or a science test. Uh, that's a formative test. Uh, the first question, if she misses it, she'll get an, the next question will be easier. If she misses the next, it will be easier again until she gets one right, and then the following question will be harder. So the test itself, very quickly, uh, and ex in with extraordinary detail and sophistication, identifies the explicit arenas or, or skills that a child needs work on. And you're using uh, game theory to do it. It, it basically comes out of uh, places like World of Warcraft exactly and so on and right. so forth. And it's very interesting. Uh, gaming, the gamification of education, people were so skeptical about it and dubious of its uh, approach, but it turns out, actually, it's a kind of uh, uh, reflection of these motivations, because kids will spend hours in any of those games to earn the next level of mastery, and the reward is uh, some sense that, uh, you know, I'm getting better, um, and that, that uh, so, so when you apply that to, to, uh, to teaching and testing, actually, it's hugely successful. So. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, we call this the three R's of recruitment, reward, and retention for talent. And the very bad news is that in contrast to high-performing countries, in the United States, students in college with the lowest grades and test scores um, end up in education programs um, instead of the top talent. In Japan and Singapore and Finland, there are actually policies you cannot apply to, the t to become a teacher until, unless you're in the top of your class. So there is a default in terms of talent. You need to be very smart in two ways. It's not just academically smart, uh, sort of the IQ measurements, you know, grades and test scores, but it's also emotionally smart. Because very, very, you know, very, very smart people are not actually necessarily people smart. Right. Um, and so the great teachers have both high IQ and high EQ, especially in terms of empathy and social judgment. Emotional IQ. Mm, emotional yeah. IQ, exactly. In terms of the type of competence and the type of attitude that you're recruiting mm -hmm. for right. in this modern school, what do you look for? Because it's not the person who's necessarily great at delivering a lecture right. anymore, and particularly with, with the availability of self-guided uh, learning processes, uh, technology, and so on. It seems that the old way of hiring mm -hmm. a teacher was so much more convenient. Well, it was ostensibly easier because you had uh, more direct uh, uh, objective correlatives. You know, this we're looking for a physics major, and this person went was a physics major and had all A's in physics, and therefore, de facto, he or she would be a good teacher. Well, it turns out half of them were and half of them weren't because some physics majors or English majors or whatever didn't have the emotional intelligence to be a good teacher. So, um, yeah, you've, you've actually identified one of those big, big shifts that we're having some trouble trying to come to terms with, especially as faculty. And that's the shift between teacher-centered and student-centered. And are you looking for the teacher that has the greatest beneficial impact right. on a student, but without the preconception of what that measurement m should be? Because students, students are different. They are very different. And actually, the research, again, is a little bit alarming. What the research tells us is that uh, once a teacher gets a fix on his or her expectation from the student, whether or not it's accurate, it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. So I'm actually advocating something that uh, is very hard for teachers to accept, which is I don't believe they should do what they think is best practice. I don't believe the third grade teacher should be looking at the test scores of the second grade st students matriculating into her class. Hmm. Um, because at every level, 
consciously and unconsciously. It sets an ex either a low bar or a high bar. And the research that documents this was uh, executed this way. Teachers were told that a group of students who were underachievers were actually high achievers. And the next year they became high achievers. Interesting. And another set of teachers were told a high achieving group of students were low achievers. And in their, that year they became low achievers. So um, it's very tricky business here. So you're right. Uh, what we're looking for are teachers who believe that all children can learn and can learn deeply and are committed to that. So you know, one of my criteria for great teachers is this, that any time a student fails, he or she owns the failure. The teacher owns part of that failure um, because great teachers think this way. Uh, this child may have some learning issues and differences and I, I just have not found the switch for this child. I'm not giving up till I find the switch that I can flip with this child till she succeeds. That's what great teachers do. How do you award teachers who really spend time right. thinking about these questions and going for the hard solutions right. that might be more effective? Um, how do you reward people for effectiveness right. in a school environment given all the complexities of of defining what success is for right. an individual child. When you were a school, your children were in school, your children in school were, were in school. Did you know who the great teachers were? Yes. Did everybody know who the great yes. teachers were? So this is universally true in every country. Everyone knows who the great teachers are, and everyone knows who the poor teachers are. It's public knowledge. We don't need a lot of screening or testing or anything else. It, it doesn't take any time at all to walk into a school and begin to identify great teachers and poor teachers. Um, so how do you reward the great teachers so they don't become ex exasperated? You know what? The climate in some schools is so um, militantly um, undermining of being, doing more work or uh, being recognized as uh, an exceptional teacher, you know, there are teachers in America who refuse Teacher of the Year awards because their peers uh, might uh, condemn them and, in fact, do. That's a, that, if you're in a school like that or your kid's in a school like that, that's a toxic environment. Right. Those schools should be closed, right? When, that, when, that, when, that, when the culture of the adults is, is so, uh, you know, poor for, for the growth, growth of students. So. so part of the answer is first to foster a, cu a culture yes. that wishes to recognize. Yes. Uh, if everybody knows, right. then, then, then the missing piece is the recognition. Right. So how do we recognize? Part of the challenge in school is that uh, merit pay as a concept hasn't worked in public or private schools um, in the straight business sense because uh, the way it's been presented historically is a board uh, will say, okay, well, here's the entire salary pot. We're not changing that. But what we're changing is that some of you will get more, the yes. ones the administrators decide are great, and, s and most of you will get less. Well, in the collegial world of teaching, that doesn't sell at all because pe teachers do need to collaborate and be collegial one with one another. So there is a better way to do it, in my opinion, and it's the one that, that I advocate, which is um, if you already know who the great teachers are, we lose great teachers, not ten we tend to lose them not because of issues of money, but because of absence of leadership opportunity. So the, in the School of Future, I believe we'll create all kinds of leadership opportunities for teachers. Right now in our sector, in education, if you want to be in a leadership role, you have to l jump ship. You have to leave teaching and become an administrator. It's the only path. It's the only real career path in education, which is exactly wrong. So I would create a dozen or 24 academic leadership roles. I'm, I'm looking for the, uh, let's say, the task force leader of the brain-based teaching and learning research team or the task force leader of the differentiated instruction team or the flip teaching. You know, there, I could name 20 categories that the 21st century is telling us we must pursue to create great, great schools. And so I would, uh, for the years in which you're, you're a great teacher and you want to be a leader, I will compensate you for more work because that works in a, in a faculty culture. We can keep the scale or the no normal progression, 
But for those, each of those years, I'm going to give you, you know, X amount of additional dollars as recognition and additional compensation for the additional work. That, that actually uh, can work in all schools. And you can also provide greater independence. You exactly. talked about those three things that exactly. people uh, value. Right. And, and that could be non-monetary, right. uh, but, but really specific ways in which to recognize right. and, to, um, and to encourage right. people who are great. And to professionalize the profession. I mean, our, our profession does not act as if it were a profession enough. Not enough expectation for true growth, um, true ado uh, adoption of uh, new thinking, new evidence, right? Um, so that, that we need to incentivize that and, and actually expect it. There's an awful lot of wisdom that was um, stored in such things as the guild system, where excellence you, be, you start off as an apprentice, you become a, journey, a journeyman, a journey person, and then you become a senior, a master, a master teacher. Um, now it seems that people, once they become a master teacher, the first thing you do is take them out of teaching and move yeah. them into administration. Right, yeah. So what makes a great administrator? Right. What makes a great person to organize the delivery of the teaching process? Well, great administrators have to be both managers and, and leaders. And uh, I'm fond of uh, John Cotter's distinction, an organizational theorist. He says that uh, managers, their job is to uh, organize and um, guarantee delivery, if you will, and put in, in place the conditions so that uh, predictability and order prevail. So poor organizations, poor schools, or any other organizations are chaotic. Good organizations are orderly and disciplined, right? And everyone expects that level of competence in their managers. Administrators have to be able to deliver on that. But leaders do something different. Leaders actually inspire people, and they uh, rally them behind change. They set the conditions so that the resources and the vision and the leadership is evident to address real change and dramatic change. Now, there are two, in, in the school business, there are two extraordinarily difficult realities that militate against um, this membrane between um, management and leadership. One is that schools are messy places by nature, and administrators' days are filled with putting out brush fires. Interrupt, the interrupt-driven day. Exactly. It's, and, of course, it's been accelerated by technology, so teachers in the classroom you know, they'll get telephone calls m during class, and parents will say, well, I emailed you 30 seconds ago, and I haven't had a response yet. <laughs> well, I can't respond. I, I don't know how this call got through because I'm teaching, you know, 20 children right now. Yeah. So the expectation for immediate response militates against teachers and administrators actually doing thoughtful uh, preparation for the future. So uh, that's, that's one uh, challenge in this, in this distinction between management and leadership. The second is that every, if, you, if I gave people a choice in all walks of life, would you prefer stability or dramatic change? Most people would prefer <laughs> stability. People yes. don't like dramatic change. People don't like dramatic change. So to effect the change that we need in schools is going to require dramatic change, rethinking the whole paradigm of teaching and learning. And so um, the reason schools don't change is that the odds are, are against it, one, and the incentives oppose it. You're disincentivized to be a change agent. I'm fond of saying that uh, no change agent ever goes unpunished, especially in schools. So how do we do this? How, how is it that in the independent school world we have uh, this extraordinary experimentation going on in many quarters? And also, by the way, in the public sector. Maybe America's uh, most successful public school is New Tech High in San Diego. And I know it is uh, by, I, by the fact that, one, I visited it, but, but two, for every teacher opening, they have a 1,000 applicants. So in California, everyone knows, I want to work at that school. By the way, it's all project-based. It's not sit in rows on a table and let's study page, chapter three. Right. It's all studying math and language arts in the service of doing something useful, which is exactly what kids want to do, we talked about earlier. So you can, you can you, when you have visionary leaders uh, and you give them some freedom, they can, they can actually effect that change. But the way they do it 
is they identify the change of depth uh, faculty, as industry does. Not everyone in large corporations is ready for change or is an initiator, but you know who they are, and you know who the first followers are, and you organize them. So um, I guess my short way of saying this would be if every decision has to be made by consensus, is, which is what schools and universities want to do, then dramatic change is very seldom. So happens. you're saying allow room for leadership. Exactly. Um, create a culture that embraces risk yes. and change, experiment, yes. dare to fail, because right. if you don't dare to, to uh, fail, your success right. will, will be at best right. uh, mediocre. Exactly. Um, and, and create a, um, a level of communication in which this sensibility right. can actually be shared and infect both the, uh, well, all parties, the, mm -hmm. the, the teachers, the students, the parents, and parents need to also have an acceptance right. of that risk, of that exploration. They do. they do. It's an excellent observation. I find parents more conservative than virtually any other constituency. And they're very worried. You know, we have a whole generation of parents who are, are daily, daily exercised with fear about the prospects for their children. They're looking out at a world that's crumbling around us in many ways. And feeling so, so frightened by what that means for their kids. So when, when, you're, when you're, your basic daily experience is fear, um, you retreat into the safety of what worked for you. And what worked for you was to be bored to death, stuck in your chair for 13 years, many of us, right? That didn't work for me, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's what I, you know, it didn't work really for anyone is what I'm saying, right. but, you know, you got through... And so the fear it is, It was well, made to work, despite... Yeah, it was made to work, right. right. So the feeling is, well, it was boring, but it, maybe it's supposed to be boring. Right. Maybe, you're, maybe that's part of the lesson. You have to suffer <laughs> when you're in a learning mode. Well, I don't think so, because I've, I've seen way better, and I've experienced way better. So when you actually can talk genuinely with parents and reassure them, that, you know, they know what the difference is that I'm describing, and they wish their kid could be in the environment that's thrilling to be in. I'm excited by being in this class, right? Uh, but they're fearful if the mode of delivery is different that somehow their kids won't pass the test and get into college and these sorts of things. So as long as we can show them that in fact, not only do they pass the test, they do better on the test. They're better thinkers, right? And that's what the uh, evidence is suggesting. Give kids real learning, real opportunity to uh, grow and to participate and co-create. This is one of these other big shifts. The difference between consuming information and knowledge and co-creating it. Once they co-create knowledge, it's, it's with them forever, not just for the test, and they become better students. Is cross-fertilization a part of this? Uh, sometimes we, um, we go in one direction um, and we develop our conventional knowledge, and as we build teams to deploy that knowledge, we build teams out of people who already have brought have bought in mm -hmm. to that conventional way of proceeding right and so you if you're strong you become stronger stronger more structured uh, and eventually ossified mm -hmm. in that particular approach right is is part of of what you're advocating a cross fertilizing sensibility right in which you have teams and people and you go outside of particular areas to bring new ideas and, uh, and, and maybe you're going to give up something right. in, that, in that process. Right. Well, that's exactly how the great innovations happen in all other sectors. So um, you take a company like Ideal uh, in California, right. one of the great and famous uh, design companies. They do all kinds of designs like new shopping carts and new toothpaste uh, Containers You've read Tom, Tom's book. Yeah, it's fabulous stuff. You know, we, we bring in IDEO to talk to our leaders because we want them to think the way the I, IDEO folks think. So uh, when they form a team, it's very fluid. It's, we, they always have certain people around that table, some of their most creative people, but they also have a, an anthropologist because unless you have diversity of experience and diversity of professional training, you all start aligning, as you say, in, in the same channel. So uh, the anthropologist will be the first to say, although people said this on the survey, what they actually do is that. 
one great example of this is that when you ask Americans, when you're at a stoplight in your car, what kind of music uh, do you listen to? And this huge percentage of Americans say classical music, <laughs> which is not true. This, these are anonymous surveys, so why would anyone lie anonymously? Because we know that only about 1% of Americans, we know from the hard data, actually listen to classical music in their car. So why would American lie? Well, lie, lie about that. Well, that, that would be an interesting conversation, but, but the larger point is observe how Americans listen to music. Right. Observe how kids actually interact with each other, other kids and teachers, and you'll know about what, what good learning and bad learning looks like. And it, it, it requires a, a different way of administering. It, it right. creates a different openness to share right. in the decisions of what ends up being provided at the school. Right. Um, different voices start impinging. Right. Different people are recognized as, as experts in their sector. So right. the voices are not shut down because right. we are the knowledge holders and you need to listen to us. Exactly. It's, it, it really does create a shift that pervades right. uh, so much of how one sees even one's own role. It's very, very true. Uh, you know, I think, I think if you think, imagine the great leaders in history, they all knew one thing for sure. And that is in their thinking and speaking, they, they created what the Heath brothers uh, call a, post, a, uh, a postcard from the future. Um, in other words, Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech. You, you, you literally saw the future he imagined in the I Have, I have a Dream speech, right? Um, and when President Kennedy launched his ambitious plan to put a man on the moon, we all saw that. So here's the destination. Then once, once people know what the, de that the, le the leader, of course, creates the vision of where our destination is, but then has to create the conditions. This is very important. Even with a big vision, if you don't create the conditions so people can succeed, then you're going to fail. So the leader creates the conditions for, for success, but then light touch afterwards. You create the team, give them the freedom to you know, explore different ways to, to get to that destination. And that's the role right. of each head of school, exactly. each board chair. Exactly. It's the role, uh, it's really our role. Mm -hmm. Our role, mindful of the, of the educational experience that we might not have enjoyed, that we do not then uh, feel like we need to slavishly, right. because of our own fears and risk aversion, mm -hmm. Um, subject our children right. to those to those experiences, and then we have to think out of the box. Right. What do we do now? Right. And that might be a fearful question, but it's a wonderful question to have to it answer. Is. And you know, uh, schools. I, I I think politically, if you will, and practically, to get the kind of change that some schools need and want, but are hesitant to to achieve to experiment with. They fear that uh, the colleges won't like it, let's say. We know all of our schools are college prep. If, we're in, if you're in elementary school or a learning difference school, you're still college prep. Parents choose our schools because they know the curriculum will help their child go to college and graduate. That's what we do, right? So that's a big ambition that the constituents have, and they, f they fear that experimentation could jeopardize it. So what smart schools do, the elementary schools talk to the secondary schools they send their kids to, and the secondary schools talk to the college they send their kids to, and here's what the conversation goes like. We want to try this, and, uh, but we're fearful our parents will, will uh, reject it for fear that you won't accept them. And so what happens when we actually have these conversations is that the secondary schools and the colleges say back to us, we trust you. We track all of your graduates who come to our schools. They do extremely well. They've been well prepared. We know the teachers know what they're doing. So do what you want. Do what you think and the faculty think is best, and uh, we, we, we feel certain that they'll be successful. And in all honesty, so many of these colleges and universities are going through the same type of thinking they are. Um, as, as they look at their models right. uh, and finding their models are deficient in terms of addressing the needs of their students right. going into the future. They wish to learn from the innovations that, the, that independent and public and, mm -hmm. and other schools uh, are bringing to them so that they can adjust. Indeed. It's it really is a dialogue, and right. sometimes it is just a matter of everybody owning up to the fact that we don't necessarily have the answers, and old models aren't right. necessarily scaled to the, to future needs. 
you know, kids are amazingly adaptive. They'll adapt to toxic environments. They'll adapt to uh, ideal environments. Of course, you want to create the ideal environments. But they adapt to the basic uh, expectations of any environment. So if the expectations are high achievement, um, in the most experimental environment, they will achieve very high. They'll also, if the, if the expectations are high achievement in an extremely rigid and traditional environment, they'll still achieve high, highly because they adapt for the most part. The thing is, um, you, can, you can achieve that outcome, high achievement, in a way that electrifies kids and not depresses them. You know, I was on a panel with the president of Stanford, the president of, um, the, actually the dean of, the, of arts and science, the College of Arts and Science at Harvard, the president of Georgetown University, and the dean at Olin, which is an engineering school, on this very topic of you know, schools of the future, 21st century schools. And they said that the kids they get, of course, these are very elite colleges, very highly, highly uh, selective. So they're getting the best of America's kids. And they say that uh, what they and their faculty uh, are discouraged by is that they get smart kids in terms of test scores and grades, but the kids aren't inventive. They're not uh, divergent thinkers. They're not the, going to be the generation who uh, you know, changes the world if they can't break out of the conformist mold they come to college in. So it's good to hear from leaders of those colleges that what they really want is what we can and should produce, and it's what would, uh, would uh, engage kids, giving them, giving them more freedom to do stuff that's extraordinarily meaningful. I'll just give you one example. So. Um, Urban School in San Francisco um, has a long history of not only doing this themselves but teaching other schools how to do it, of uh, videotaping oral histories. And so you got a choice here. Let's read about the in internment of the Japanese during the Second World War or the Holocaust, th both, both extraordinarily powerful events, right, and meaningful and disturbing events. We can read about it. You know, most 16-year-olds, Okay, well, this is, it's chapter 37. I have to read it, and so what, right? Well, how about this? Interview your neighbors who were survivors of the internment or your neighbors who were survivors of the Holocaust. Video interviews, and that's what they do. This just changes everything because now I'm not just a consumer of information. It doesn't mean anything to me. I'm face-to-face -face with a survivor, and I'm listening to a story that's so disturbing and powerful, right? I will never, I'll forget that chapter that I read about. I will never forget that interview. Here's the bonus. The Smithsonian is collecting all oral histories. So these kids are literally making meaning that will last forever in the archives of the, of the world's history. It's, it's so it's empowering to kids. I want all classes to be like that class. And we're seeing it in every subject we teach. There's, there's ways to do this. So um, it's very encouraging in terms of what's possible with schools, public and private. But what we need, of course, is the will and the, and the conditions for this, this kind of thinking to flourish. You sketched such a compelling vision for education in the future. Thank you, Thank you so much, Pat Bassett. My pleasure. sharing your experience with us and for sharing your insights. I appreciate that very much.